Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is the recap of trial day nine in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cup, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. We finished up the cross-examination of Julie Albert on Friday. When we finished the day Thursday, the defense had just gotten into the 67 phone calls between the witness and Courtney Proctor, the sister of Massachusetts State Police, Michael Proctor, who was the lead investigator in the John O'Keefe death investigation. She was asked about whether in any of the 67 phone calls in a six-month period, including multiple calls on the day of the defendant's arrest and arraignment, whether any of those calls included any discussion about the case. The witness replied that she didn't remember. Over and over, the witness suddenly couldn't remember a thing about any of the conversations with Courtney. She couldn't remember whether she told Courtney that she and her husbands were witnesses. She couldn't remember whether she told Courtney that her son Colin had been at 34 Fairview that night. She couldn't remember whether she and Courtney discussed the defendant's arrest or the defendant's arraignment. It was like her memory was wiped out. Weird. Well, Proctor got around to interviewing the witness two weeks after John's death. He and another trooper came to the house and spoke with both Julie and Chris together. She testified that she didn't, she doesn't remember anything about that interview. And she definitely didn't remember whether she told Proctor that Colin had been at 34 Fairview on the 29th. After Proctor left the interview, Julie called his personal cell in a call that lasted five seconds, after which Proctor called her back. Unfortunately, Julie doesn't remember those calls. Shame. Let's fast forward to January 2024, this year, when the Massachusetts State Police, not including Proctor, contacted the witness about her phone. They called Julie on three separate occasions before she finally told them that she was sick and would call them back in three days. When the three days passed and they hadn't heard from her, they called her, but she avoided them, so they reached out to her husband, Chris. It was only after doing that did Julie text them and finally met with them two days later. When she met with them, they looked through her phone for her communications with Proctor. That line of questioning to me indicates a possible investigation of Michael Proctor, which I think I've heard rumors of being an actual thing, though I don't think there's been a resolution of it. But I find it interesting that the witness behaved incredibly evasive when the Massachusetts State Police was trying to get information from her. After the morning break, we were surprised to see the defense team gone, along with the defendant. Instead, we saw the prosecution and an attorney for a third party in the courtroom. That third party is named Aiden Kearney. He also goes by the moniker Turtle Boy. And Turtle Boy is a, an independent journalist, I think he calls himself. Uh, I believe he has a YouTube channel and he probably has a blog somewhere, but he has been covering the Karen Reed case from its inception. And I think he's of the camp that Karen Reed is innocent of all the charges and that this is a witch hunt against her in order to further the corruption of the governmental authorities in the city of Canton. I do know that there have been charges against him. I don't think anything has been completely ad- adjudicated yet. Um, I haven't really been following the Turtle Boy situation, but it's bad enough that it has caused a disturbance in the case. So they were arguing over whether or not Turtle Boy would be excluded, would be excused from the courtroom during the testimony of certain witnesses. The Commonwealth had made a motion two days ago to exclude him from the courtroom, and they served that motion on the Associated Press, whom they argued were the correct entities to serve journalists per court rules. The defense attorney argued that he, as the attorney for Turtle Boy, should have received notice of the motion to exclude him from the courtroom. 
this attorney said that he just so happened to be in the courthouse that morning on another matter, and he only got notice about the Commonwealth's attempt to exclude Turtle Boy from the courtroom less than 30 minutes before it came to issue. Turtle Boy was in the courtroom. He was up there uh, in, a, in a suit, looked like he was taking notes. I hadn't noticed any distraction from him. But the attorney was livid. He accused the Commonwealth of funny business and said that this was just one of many examples of the underhanded tactics that they've used. Now, the judge, after hearing the arguments, ruled that because of the chilling effect that Turtle Boy would have on the witnesses as they testified, she was granting the Commonwealth's motion and Turtle Boy was to be kicked out of the courtroom during the testimony of these witnesses, Chris Albert, Julie Nagel, Colin Albert, Michael Proctor, the McCades, Brian Albert, and Brian Albert Jr., Yuri Buchanan, and Nicole Albert. Once that sideshow ended, Nicole Albert took the stand. She was the homeowner at 34 Fairview on the night in question. She's also the sister of Jen McCabe, who was intricately involved in the events of the night. During direct examination, we learned about the time between when she left the waterfalls, went home to 34 Fairview, who she was with, who was there when she arrived at the house, and the order that people left the house. She said she saw Colin Albert briefly when she got home. He was basically on his way out of the house, waiting to get picked up by a friend while she was walking in. She said everybody was congregated in the kitchen slash dining room area of the house but that there was one point when her husband, Brian and Brian Higgins, left the room. She thought to go to the family room to show Higgins something. She said that her daughter, Caitlin, was the last to leave around 2 a.m., despite Sergeant Lank's report stating otherwise. After everybody left, Nicole went upstairs to bed with her husband, Brian Sr., who was still awake, but she doesn't recall any conversation, if any, that they had. They fell asleep and were awakened by Jen McCabe, their sister, bursting into the room sometime between 6.30 and, or sometime between 6 and 6.30. She testified that Jen was hysterical and told them that something terrible happened to John and the police needed to talk to them. Now, this was the first testimony that we're hearing Jen McCabe being hysterical the only person we've heard thus far as being described as hysterical has been Karen Reed and multiple people describe her and only her as being hysterical. So it's interesting that Jen is now being described as hysterical. Um, we heard Jen's voice earlier in testimony um, on a 911 phone call and she didn't sound hysterical at all. She sounded very calm, uh, all her faculties together, not distraught at all. So I'm not sure where this hysterical came from, but that's what the witness testified to. So the Alberts get out of bed, walk downstairs, and run into Sergeant Lank, who was just coming into the house. Matt McCabe was on his heels, and the entire group sat with Lank for a group interview. Then we get into cross-examination. We learned some interesting information. For the first time, we got testimony about Chloe the dog. Chloe is a 70-pound German Shepherd mix with a history of biting other dogs and at least one human. The witness testified that the human biting incident was when Chloe escaped the backyard, as she had done from time to time, and this time she got into a dog fight. There were two women breaking up the fight. And one of the women got bit, but both of them went to the hospital. After that, Chloe was rehomed and she is now in Vermont. The witness was quite aggravated talking about the whole Chloe situation and what became of Chloe. I kind of feel like something is there because there were a couple of questions that defense counsel tried asking that led me to believe that they were, they had attempted to get information about the whereabouts of Chloe. One of the questions that was allowed to be asked was, 
whether the witness had ever provided the whereabouts of Chloe to the Commonwealth. And she answered that she's pretty sure she provided that information to the Commonwealth. Defense counsel acted surprised and started asking, oh, who did you provide it to? When did you provide? Unfortunately, uh, they weren't able to dig any deeper because the Commonwealth asked for a sidebar, like, very quickly. And when the defense came back, they they finished their cross-examination without asking any additional questions about Chloe. So I'm curious about where that was going. If the defense had tried locating Chloe, perhaps to do some testing of the dog's DNA, I don't know, but that's going to be a lingering question in my head. We got testimony from the witness about the types, the makes, the models of the cars that her family members drove that would typically be found in the driveway at 34 Fairview. On direct examination, the witness was asked and she testified that there would usually be four cars in the driveway and she listed out the makes and models of three of those cars. The fourth car was not followed up on in direct examination. On cross-examination, the witness was asked about the fourth car, which was a Ford Edge and Brian Albert Sr.'s work vehicle. The witness denied intentionally omitting the Ford Edge from her list of known vehicles at the house, but she did admit that she knew there was some significance of a Ford Edge to the case. Now, if you'll recall from the opening statements, we were told that we would hear testimony from the snowplow drive, driver who plowed the streets of Canton as well as Fairview Road. We were told that the driver driving Frankenstein, remember, he named the snowplow Frankenstein, he had noted a particular location about the Ford Edge vehicle. We're not privy to knowing what exactly the significance of that car is yet, but I have no doubt that we'll learn about it in the next coming days and weeks of the testimony. But the defense raising the question of the witness's omission of that one particular vehicle that does have significance to the case leaves an impression in the minds of the jury that perhaps she's not being as forthcoming in her testimony as we would expect a witness to be. Then we got to the two phone calls made from Jen McCabe that were made to the witness's cell phone just after 6 a.m. when the witness and her husband were supposedly asleep. Cellbrite records indicate that uh, the witnesses, that the phone calls from Jen McCabe, they were answered and those phone calls lasted nine and seven seconds respectively. The witness denied speaking with Jen in those phone calls. She denies having spoken with Jen from the time Jen left her house in the early morning hours until the job, until the time Jen burst into her bedroom after six in the morning to wake them up. As far as she and, and Brian Albert know, um, they were woken up after 6.30, thereabouts, when Jen McKay burst into their room, hysterical, saying something happened to John, who was found outside, and the cops needed to talk to them both. So we don't know anything more about those two phone calls that Cellbrite Records established were made and were answered. Next to testify was Nicole's husband, Brian Albert Sr. He is a retired Boston police officer. And although he never worked with John O'Keefe, the two had met on a few prior occasions. And Brian also knew that John was a friend of his brother, Chris, and a friend of the McCabe's. Similar to his wife's testimony on direct, he walked us through the events of that evening in detail, leaving the waterfalls, getting home, who was home when he arrived, who came later, and the rest of his night. He testified that at some point he went upstairs to get their dog, Chloe. Once everybody had gotten to the house, he brought the dog downstairs and let her out into the backyard to relieve herself. He stayed at the door, at the back door, and let the dog in a couple of minutes later. 
He said after wandering the kitchen for a minute or two, he put Chloe back in his bedroom upstairs and she wasn't let out again that night. During the evening, he and Brian Higgins at one point left the rest of the group to go upstairs to one of his kids' bedroom because he wanted to show Higgins some Marines memorabilia. Remember, his wife testified that they had both gone to the family room, but Brian testified that they went upstairs, so a little inconsistency there. He told us that one of Brian Jr.'s friends named Julie, and I believe that's Julie Nagel, was at that party. And at some point, Julie went outside to talk to her brother who had pulled up to the house, but that she came back inside shortly thereafter. That, he said, was the only instance of somebody exiting then re-entering the house during that evening. John went to bed before everybody left the party. He'd had a long day. At 2 a.m., Nicole came to bed. Then they went to sleep. He denied ever receiving a phone call from Higgins or anybody else after 2 a.m. Testimony's already been established about what happened next, how they were woken by Jen, etc. So I just want to point out the reason this witness, a first responder, gave for not stepping foot outside his front door to see the scene where John was found. Actually, he gave a laundry list of reasons. He said, and I'm paraphrasing his quote, he didn't see a reason to go. The cops had already been in the house. There was a snowstorm. They were conducting an investigation and he didn't want to interfere or have anything to do with it. To his knowledge, when Jen woke them up, John was already on the way to the hospital, meaning he couldn't have offered John any assistance anyway. So there we have a litany of reasons that this witness gave why he, as a first responder, as a police officer at the time, did not exit his home, despite there being police activity, an entire police investigation right outside his front door. Finally, on direct, Brian Sr. testified that the spot in the yard, which is the far edge of the property, right by the property line where John was found, was a very dark area, not well lit at all. This fact might explain why nobody saw John when exiting the house in the early morning hours. Both the Alberts emphatically testified that neither John nor the defendant ever entered their house that evening. Also, fun fact, they no longer live there. They sold the house in April 2023. Brian testified that they had started talking about selling the house in late 2021 because they wanted to downsize. Unfortunately for them, in January of 2022 is when all of this went down. So that wrapped up the Commonwealth's direct examination. The defense's cross-examination will start on Monday morning. Thanks for joining me for this recap. I will see you guys back here next week for more coverage, more recapping of the trial, Commonwealth, Massachusetts versus Karen Reed. Have a wonderful weekend. Until the next drop, peace.